Welcome again, everyone here and those watching on our online community. It's great to have you here for the first Sunday of 2020. I hope you had a good new year. I hope you have a great year ahead, whatever that holds. I don't know if you saw on the news, a lot of uh, celebrities often post pictures of, uh, of themselves with their families and what they've done in the new year. And there was one particular one uh, that got a bit of press and this was Liz Hurley posting a photo with her son. It looked like one of those face swap photos, doesn't it? The resemblance is uncanny. I mean, he's quite got her features and the hair and everything like that. Don't they look alike? And I thought of all these other celebrities that, that often you see the mother or the father and, and, and the kids and you see, boy, the resemblance is just amazing. Here's one of Reese Witherspoon and her daughter. I know the hair's similar, but it's uncanny, isn't it? Here's Demi Moore with her daughter to Bruce Willis. Her name is Rumor, Rumor Willis. I think that's Demi on the right, in case you're, you're wondering. Here's a photo of Cindy Crawford with her daughter. And you can see the resemblance quite strongly there, can't you? Jack Nicholson, the actor, with a photo of his son Ray that was taken when that photo of Jack Nicholson, they're, they're the same age there. And the last one is celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay with his son. Oh, I love that hair, hey? The genes are strong with that one. Well, you've heard the saying, like father, like son or daughter, like mother, like daughter or son. And sometimes because the genes are strong, there's just a resemblance. We're almost, uh, you know, predestined to be very much like our parents. But the same is true spiritually. What, what, one of the, the, the big goals that, that God has for us is that we would be like him. And if you're into setting New Year's resolutions or working out, you know, how to improve your life, you can't go past this idea of being more like God. To, to express it in, in New Testament language, that we become more like Jesus. Not, not, not physically, not like those photos that we've seen, but in character, that we would become like him. And if we make this our aim, whatever other things that we might do, it might be getting into fitness again or getting financially fit or whatever it is, this would be a great one. It would be honouring to God. It would be biblically sound. I want to show biblically how strongly this theme comes through the whole of Scripture. And it's really worthy of your effort if you want to make this one of your big picture goals for 2020. So I want to look at this, this idea of being like Jesus and how it happened really right from the beginning in creation. In Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26, scriptures record for us this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the livestock, all the wild animals of the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So initially there, we've, we've got this God saying, let us, and that we, it's this, it's not quite the royal pronoun that the queen might use, the, you know, the royal we, but it shows that early on God is... Sometimes the word is Trinity or, or a Godhead. There is a relationship within the God. Even though there is only one God, there are three persons within the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they have this relationship between them. And we'll talk about that later, right at the end. But within that, God decided to create human beings, to give them dominion over the animals. And then verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female 
he created them. God's image is on every human being that's been made. Now, early on, earlier in Genesis, we read that all of the animals that were created were reproducing after their own kind. Cats have cats, dogs have dogs, fish have fish. And in a sense, God built that in even into what he created. And it was after his own kind, his image, his impression was given to the people that he created. Men and women both created in the image of God. Now Adam and Eve had kids. The first two, Cain killed Abel. And then they had another child. And Genesis says about that, when Adam was 130 years old, he became the father of a son who was just like him in his very image. He named his son Seth. So to draw out the point, that, that point that I'm making right at the start, is that every human being, every single person, is made in God's image. Every person you lock eyes on, every person here, every person out there in the world, every person you'll see at Mount Omni shopping, any person that you work with, every kid at school, every family member. Everyone is made in the image of God. Every time you look in the mirror, you see someone made in the image of God. Is the image marred? Yes, it is. Is the image damaged? Incredibly sometimes. But everyone is made in the image of God. So when Adam and Eve broke God's rules, when they went away from what he intended in the Garden of Eden, God needed to establish a, a set of rules so that everyone wouldn't just have an arbitrary set of what they thought was right and wrong, so that people wouldn't just come up with their own version of, of goodness. He, he, he needed to, to put it down, to lay it down. This is what's right and this is what's wrong, so that everyone would know. He had to establish that so that everyone didn't have their own different standard. But this is what he said in, in, in Leviticus and a number of places. It's repeated often. Give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I believe there's a lot of good reasons why we should do the right thing. You know, there is, a, there is a law and we shouldn't break the law. I believe we should do the right thing because there are consequences. I think God has built into the fabric of creation. When we do the wrong thing, there are consequences. There are, there are limits and when we go beyond those limits, bad things happen. But God didn't say any of these to the nation of Israel when he's saying them that they should be holy. He said, I want you to be holy because I am holy. I want you to be this because that's the way I am. And if you're a parent, you know that one of those great desires that you have as a parent is that you want your kids to be like you. And it's always great when, you, when your kids say something and you go, yes, yes. And God, more than anything, wants us to be holy because that's what he is. He says, because I'm like that. God gave the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus. He says, in there you must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or any image of anything in heaven and on earth and under the sea. And often God is reiterating that in, in Exodus, in Leviticus, not to make an image not to make a metal god or a wooden god, at some sort of statue that purports to be God. Because I think he's saying, don't make me into that sort of likeness. Don't make an image of me that looks like that. Because I want the likeness of me to be in you. I don't want it to be limited to, to even gold or silver. I want you to be my likeness. I want you to be living out the life 
that I want. Again, the point out of those scriptures is this, that God wants the best out of us because he wants us to be a reflection of himself. Just like we as a parent would, God wants us to be a reflection of himself. And that happened as Jesus came. The qualities that God wanted, that he, that he expressed in himself, that he revealed to people, it's very hard to see because in, in God is, is invisible. And it's hard for us, you know, how do you, how do you put hands and feet on it? And that's one reason, maybe not the most important reason, but that's one very important reason why Jesus came. Paul says some of the qualities of God are in creation. We look at creation and we see how powerful it is, how beautiful it is at times. There is order in the creation and maybe we can reveal that some of those things that God has revealed in creation can make us conclude that that's what God is like. But so many of the other qualities, it's, it's difficult. God is so ethereal, he's out there and it's invisible. So God, as the Son of God, became human being and came to earth and that's what we just celebrated at Christmas. And at Christmas we saw the, the enfleshment, the, the coming of God in human form so that we could see in a human being and we could read from people who met that human being what God would be like if he was human. Now the first step in that is salvation, that God needed to, to have a punishment for sins and Jesus was prepared to come to earth to take that punishment for all of us, to die in our place for that. But that's just the beginning of the story, that's not the end. It's not that we have a ticket to heaven in our back pocket and that's all we need to do. Paul in his great letter in Romans, as he's talked about salvation, then comes to the point of, okay, what, what, what do we do then? He says in Romans 8, I love it in the message, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity restored and we see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. The older versions that had about us being predestined to be conformed to the image of his son but I love the way it says it there. We see the original and intended form, the shape of our lives in Jesus. So the point there is that Jesus is the model for all humanity. Jesus becomes God's intended example of what it was to be made in the image of God in the first place, even though Adam and Eve stuffed that up. But we see in Jesus what God intended it to be all along but it's not just something that we aim for as individuals God has put the church in place in order to do that in the great letter he, Paul wrote to Ephesians he says this Christ gave gifts to people he made some to be apostles some to be prophets some to go and tell the good news and some to have the work of caring for and teaching God's people Christ gave those gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving, to make the body of Christ stronger. This work must continue until we are all joined together in the same faith, in the same knowledge of the Son of God. We must become like a mature person, growing until we all become like Christ and have his perfection. So the goal to become like Jesus is not just something that we struggle with individually. That's why we have church. That's why there are those gifts of apostles and prophets that establish the church and pastors and teachers now. And notice that it's not just about input. I shared last week in the message. It's about serving. And in serving, we learn 
to grow. We learn to grow in Christ-likeness when we serve. So the point out of that is that we live up to Christ's example, not just as individuals, but as a collective. That together we help each other grow. And that's why it's so important to be there and to serve together in the life of the church in order for all of us to be able to grow together, to aim for that maturity, to be in that image of God like God intended for us in the first place. C.S. Lewis put it this way, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, then all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. And so that becomes the goal of the church. No matter how far people are away from God or how close they are to God, our goal is together, draw people, bring them to Christ, expose them to who he is, unite them with Christ, and help them become, as C.S. Lewis said, a little Christ, so that we are little Jesuses running around the place, trying to become more and more like him, encouraging those who are far from Jesus to come to him so that we will become like him. But are we just kidding ourselves to do that? Because there's a great sense of inadequacy if I was to ask you, I think, how close are you to being like Jesus? Greg made a great point last week when he was praying. He said he's been reading the Old Testament and he came to this conclusion that it's impossible to live up to the laws. And I think that was really profound, Greg. Greg. Because I've heard people that have read that and come up with the other conclusion. No, we need to be more this and we need to not have, you know, baked ham for Christmas and no prawns or crabs anymore. You know, we need to, you know, that'd be horrible for some people. But God just doesn't give us this unattainable goal and then leave us to ourselves. God is not, not mocking us here. He's not giving us a challenge to do that and then leaving us to our own devices to do that. He's given us the church. He's given us the Bible. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us so many resources in order to help us to do that. Next week, I want to look more specifically about what qualities of Jesus that we could emulate, that, that the Bible specifically talks about th these qualities that is the example of Jesus. And it's not as if we just imitate him either. You know, in the 60s with the Jesus people, there are people that guys have let their hair grow, have big beards, you know, wear sandals, wear the caftan, and, you know, I'm like Jesus now. It, it, it's not, you know, just doing that sort of stuff. That's, that's where the word hypocrite comes from in the olden days, in the... In the Greek times, they would have actors, but they would wear a mask. You know, they wouldn't have a lot of different people to act, but they would wear a different mask. And that's a hypocrite was literally an actor, a pretender. And it came to mean something who, who said they had a particular value or tried to force it on others, but didn't live up to it themselves. That's what a hypocrite was. So it's not just this external coming like Jesus. That's one of the criticisms I've heard these days with the Academy Awards, you know, often comes up at the beginning of the year and people just, someone had commented the number of people that won awards, they said not for acting but impersonating other people. You know, Remy Malek for, um, for the Freddie Mercury one. You know, um, David Healthcott, I'm not sure that um, Jeffrey Rush actually plays the piano like David Helfcott, but with prosthetics these days and wigs and costumes and dialect coaches, 
People can look like and sound like these people, but they're not really those people. And we've got to be careful as Christians that we don't speak the language and look holy, but internally, at a heart level, nothing changes. How does that Godhead come into that again? God the Father, God the Father wants us to live up to the image that he first created in us. God the Son gives us the human example to live up to. And God the Holy Spirit works in us to transform us into the image of Jesus. Let me just finish with this story. When, as I said before, our girls have been in Japan with Disneyland where my son works now, but for a while he was playing very high level soccer. Uh, he played at Ipswich Grammar. Uh, Ipswich Grammar won two national competitions for uh, under 15, the Bill Turner Cup. He played NPL soccer, National Premier League. Um, Two of the boys that he played with at Grammar actually are in the uh, Central Coast Mariners junior squad, uh, Dan and, and, and Alex. So Nate played at a really, really high level, state championships, all that sort of thing. He got to the point where I couldn't coach him as, as well anymore, I thought, to develop him. But I still had a couple of tricks up my sleeve and things that I'd read along the way. And I remember him playing in an NPL game and it was the, the, the two squads played under 15s and under 16s, and he was under 15s. And I, I taught him this technique, often in, in soccer, when you're shoulder to shoulder with someone, it's, you know, you can't, it's not rugby league, you can't throw them out the way or give them a, an elbow, but I taught him this technique of if you're shoulder to shoulder to someone, you can, if you can just get your shoulder, you know, dip your shoulder and get it in front of the guy that you're shoulder to shoulder with. Physically, you know, once you're in front, the rest of your body's got to, got to follow. And even though he was, he was smaller, he was probably not as quick, not as strong, but he had the technique right. I remember he, he ran past me and, and he did this technique, got in front of him, got the ball off and, and came back around. And I was really excited because I'd, I'd taught him this, you know, fairly often. And he, and he did it right. He had a smile on his face as he, as he came back past me. And as I was just looking on, you know, as all the parents do, and just as he came past with a smile, you know, like you do, Dad's on the sideline, I just said, that's my boy. And the coach looked around and said, oh, who's that, who's that? And, you know, wrote his name down. I have a theory... We saw the video before, the baptism of Jesus. And a lot of times, you know, God, I think, sits up in heaven and he must, he must have to button his lip at the stuff that he sees. There's a lot of bad stuff that he must want to yell out and there's some good stuff too, but a lot of the times God is not vocal out of heaven. Sometimes we see that in, in scriptures, but a lot of times he's not. We see this occasion that we looked at in the video before the baptism of Jesus. And he is, you know, we just celebrated Christmas and God has, has given his son. He's been born. We've just celebrated that in the last couple of weeks. And then for 30 years, Jesus lives in relative obscurity. He's preparing himself. God, I'm sure, has inputted into him about all the stuff that would be ahead, all the things that are going on all the stuff that he would endure. And then John the Baptist comes up. He's preparing the way for people. And this is the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. He's baptising people. And Jesus comes to be baptised himself. He doesn't need to be baptised. He doesn't have any sins to be forgiven. But this is, this is his identification with people. This is, this is the full, you know, oh, I'm, I'm all in. And the Holy Spirit comes, and I know it says in the Scriptures, it says, Here is my beloved Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. But in my mind, God just yells out, That's my boy! That's my boy! 
And I would hope at times in this year ahead as you aim to be like Jesus, whether you hear the voice of God or not, that you sense the voice of God saying to you, that's my boy. That's my girl. When we see you praying for his kingdom to come and his will to be done, when you forgive someone when it's difficult, when you suffer and don't get a bad attitude through it, when you're empathic to people, when you're wanting to have the joy in the circumstances you have, even though the the circumstance isn't very good, when you're trying to be like Jesus, you get the sense that God in heaven is saying to you, that's my boy, that's my girl. Like father, like son, like you. Let's pray. Father, as we think of our own families, we know sometimes there's a resemblance there and if we've got together over Christmas, people will talk about the resemblance. But Lord, I just pray that we would have a resemblance that looks like you. That Lord, this year, whatever good habits we want to put in and good good New Year's resolutions that we have, that we would make this a big picture one, that we would aim to be like Jesus in everything that we do, everything we say. Lord, help us to be like you. And help us to hear, even if it's not in an audible voice, hear your pleasure in calling out that as hard as it's been, that we've done the right thing. We've tried to be like you. You've helped us to do that and we've responded as much as we can. Lord, help us to be and to attract people to be a whole lot of little Christs, living out your desire for us right from the beginning. We would draw people to you, unite them in you and equip them to be like you. It's in your name, in the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.